Okay. <clears throat> and uh, game plan for tonight is to wrap up chapter three material. Um, <clears throat> there were a couple of class questions from last time um, that um, we uh, didn't cover that I said I wanted to go through with you. Now, you may have already worked these um, in your chapter three homework as you wrapped up that module. Um, I guess it was what module, uh, what module is that for inventory? Module three, I guess, because you'd wrapped up module three homework, you probably saw these questions, but I wanted to go through them anyway um, because we didn't get a chance last time as we wrapped up class. And there are some test taking technique issues that I'd like to talk about with you for these particular questions. So um, the main reason I'm going through these is yes, to emphasize accounting for inventory or the different inventory methods and whatnot, but uh, also, because uh, that is a heavy area on the exam, 10 points, but also to give you some test taking technique. I think these questions offer a good example of that. So with that, um, let's go ahead and I'm not gonna, open the poll for these. I'm just going to go straight in and work these with you. And so we've got this uh, Bren company's beginning inventory January 1st was understated by 26,000 and its ending inventory was overstated by 52,000. And a result, Bren's cost of goods sold for year three was, and we need to determine if it's overstated or understated. Now, the reason I wanted to go through this with you, a common mistake that I think students make, candidates make on a question like this, is they try to deal with both of these misstatements simultaneously. And you start to get your wires crossed and you start netting them and making mistakes that are gonna lead you down the wrong path. So I like to deal with each one of these problems separately. So what I would do is I'd first remind myself that beginning inventory, Okay, plus what? Plus purchases gives us <clears throat> goods available for sale minus the ending inventory will equal the cost of goods sold, right? Okay, which is what the question was asking me, or at least what are the effects of these overstatements and understatements on the cost of goods sold? And what I would do is I would suggest that you take each of these misstatements separately and see what the effect is on the cost of goods sold. So if beginning inventory is understated by 26,000, that means it's what, 26,000 too little, right? It's understated. I don't care what the purchases are. They don't give me purchases anyway. And so I would just roll with that. So that means that if I add purchases to an understated by 26,000 beginning inventory, that means my goods available for sale is understated by 26,000. If my goods available for sale is understated by 26,000, I subtract my ending inventory. It doesn't matter what it is at this point. I know they gave me some information, but I'm going to deal with that separately. That means that my cost of goods sold is what? 26,000 understated. Now, when you look at this, you could almost automatically get rid of what? Get rid of the two that just have the 26,000 is part of the uh, situation here because you're looking and saying, well, how can that be um, when I know I still have to deal with the problem with the ending inventory? And you eyeball a little bit further and you say, well, the two 78,000s are what? Are basically, um, you know, the sum of the 56 and the 78. So really, if I got stuck at this point in time, I could get rid of the overstated because how could it be that one problem was understating it, the other potentially overstating it, that should net out to what, 52,000. But you would keep going here and you would say, well, okay, beginning inventory, whatever it is, my, sorry guys, Zoom is messing with me here. Put something in my way that I don't want in my way. My beginning inventory, I don't care what it is, my purchases, doesn't matter what they are, they didn't give me anything anyway, and goods available for sale, whatever it is. If my ending inventory is what? Overstated by 52,000. If it's overstated, that means the ending inventory is 52,000 what? 
too big. That means when I calculated my cost of goods sold, I would have done what? I would have subtracted too much from my goods available for sale to calculate my cost of goods sold. So I would have had what? A cost of goods sold that is understated by 52,000 because of that problem with the ending inventory being overstated. Thus, the what the sum of that is that the um, cost of goods sold is understated by 78,000. Question? Okay. I'm of the opinion that it is better to sit here and take each one of these problems or issues separately because it starts to really eliminate quickly some of the other choices and really start pushing you in the direction towards the right one when you look at it that way. Okay, good. It's understated by 78. That's two negatives. Okay. Okay, good. Now you look at um, this next one. And this next one is talking about the last in, first out inventory method. And when we start to look at it, they ask us, well, what would happen under perpetual and what would happen under periodic? Okay. Now, when we look at this, because they're using what they're using the um, LIFO method, we know that under LIFO, what you're going to have a different answer if you use perpetual versus periodic. We saw that in the example that we went through in class together. So you start looking at that and you can look at what? You could look at both D and C and get rid of those right out the gate because under LIFO, we don't have the same answer under periodic versus perpetual. Then we start to look at the information here and we say, okay, well, can we get to um, either A or B? And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start with perpetual. And the information tells me for perpetual, now that I'm calculating, I'm just going to put perpetual here. When I look at the table of information, they say, well, they had a beginning balance of two, they purchased 12, they sold eight, and then that last purchase came in after uh, they had sold those 1,800. And they want to know what is what what is in the inventory, what is the ending inventory of January 31st. So I look at that and say, well, if it's last in, first out, I'm looking, and that means that they would have what? The 800 under perpetual would have come in after that last, uh, after that sale. And I have to update my inventory records after each purchase, after each sale. And those 800 that are coming in at $5 each weren't here yet. So I know that all of those are going to be left in ending inventory under the perpetual system. So 800 times the five, I don't really need to do that extension here because they gave it to me is 4,000. So I know. I've got that 4,000. And then I'm going to look and say, well, okay, they sold 18, which means under LIPO, we assume they would have sold all of those that were purchased the last time before that sale on the 23rd, on the 8th. And they need what? They need 600 more to make up the sale of 1,800. So if they sold 600 um, of those, that means there's only 1,400 left. If there's only 1,400 left, 1,400, and those are coming in at what? At a dollar each, came in at a dollar each. That gives me, again, $1,400. And so I go ahead and I add those two together. That means the ending inventory is valued at 5,400. And I look at the choices, and I know the answer has to be B now. I don't even have to look at the periodic to figure out what the answer should be because I already eliminated C and D and B is the one that lines up with perpetual. So I would do perpetual first in this one, but just to complete the thought, let's just go ahead and look at the periodic, okay? And so what happens? Under the periodic method, we would have our beginning inventory and they tell us at the beginning inventory, I'm just gonna erase this stuff now because I don't wanna confuse it with what we're going to do for periodic. The beginning inventory is what? Is 2,000. I have to add the purchases and I have purchases of what? I have purchases of the 3,600 
And then I had purchases of the 4,000, didn't I? So that gives me total purchases of 7,600 plus the 2,000 means I had goods available for sale of 9,600. Okay. And then I would go ahead and I'd say, well, minus the ending inventory, I'm supposed to calculate here to answer the question, would give me the cost of goods sold. So now I just have to figure out, well, what was the cost of goods sold and under what? Under the um, uh, FIFO method, I would have had what? I would have had 800. Um, I would have, yeah, where am I going with this? My cost of goods sold would have been what? First in, first out. So I would have sold um, to make up the, um, how many units did they sell? Now I'm having a problem here. To make up the 1,800 units that they uh, sold under LIFO, excuse me, not, that's what was confusing me. Why was I saying FIFO? Were you doing LIFO in this question? Under the LIFO, I would have what? I would have assumed that I sold 800 at what? At the $5 or 400. And I would have assumed that I sold what? That I would have sold, uh, I need another thousand. And I would have sold those at what? At $3. So that would have given me 3,000. So my total cost of goods sold would have been what? Would have been um, not 400, but 4,000 would have been 7,000. So if my cost of goods sold was 7,000 and my goods available for sale was 96, 96 minus 7,000 would have given me what? Would have given me the 2,600, the correct answer to this question. Now, again, um, a question like this might take you the full maximum time that we spend with a question, three minutes. But the point of me going through this is if you started to get to where you're maybe spinning your wheels with something like this, you're feeling that you're spending too much time with a question, you could almost get to the right answer just by, you know, working this part and eliminating C and D and backing into B. Question. Okay, good. So that's what I wanted to do last time. And we sort of ran out of time. And I think we were probably tired at that point. And so I didn't want to, uh, you know, sit there and uh, kind of do that at the end. So maybe you saw some of that on your own when you were working through those uh, questions for your homework. Um, and uh, we're going to go ahead now and continue with module four. Okay. Now, property plan and equipment. Okay, property, plant, and equipment is going to be land, building, equipment. Okay, now when we value our property, plant, equipment, as you've known for a long time, we use historical costs, whatever we paid for that. Of course, we're going to see that we will evaluate our uh, fixed assets for impairment um, each year. And we're going to talk a little bit later about how to do that evaluation on fixed assets for impairment. Okay. Now you come over and we start to break the property plan equipment down to its elements. Property. Okay. Now the cost of land is whatever the purchase price is. But I want you to flashcard a couple things just because it probably doesn't leak to mind that that's part of the cost of the land. Any cost that you have to incur to take that land free and clear of title is part of the cost of that land. So brokers, commissions, title and recording fees. Okay, any legal fees, draining of swamps, clearing of brushes and trees, so on, uh, tearing down an old building. And then if there's any scrap, okay, that's left, or if you can sell some timber or something, those things would uh, be a subtract from the total cost of land. Very straightforward stuff, guys. Flashcard the ones I've highlighted here. Not a big deal, not that complicated. We're going to look at one question tonight. We will kind of try to parse out what should be included in the property plan equipment account. And uh, you'll see when you start to work those homework questions, may you get 50, you know, CPA exam point questions that ask you about this stuff. Very, 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 very easy. You won't get 50 because it's easy. I'm praying that you will, but I don't think you will. You'll get much less than that. Okay. 
Now, when we talk about land improvements, okay, so anything that you start to put as an addition to the land, and what I always like to give is a visual, um, you know, when you're buying, say, a new house or something, and you go around and you look at what lot do you want? Oh, that's the lot I want because it has a nice view or whatever. All the pieces of land are nice and flat, ready to start putting in the plumbing and all that kind of stuff. That at, from that point, that is all cost of land. Once they start putting things into the land, on top of the land, those are land improvements, okay? Things like fences, water systems, landscaping is going to be considered a land improvement. And of course, land improvements will be depreciated, okay? Now, when we start to talk about the cost of the plant, cost of building, they're calling it plant here, building also would be plant, okay? Obviously, the purchase price, repairs neglected by the previous owner, sometimes called deferred maintenance. There was a bunch of dry rot in the building that they didn't kick, take care of. That is part of the cost of that building, okay? And they go on with a couple of additional uh, examples. And we'll talk about construction period interest here in a couple of seconds. But I want you to flashcard this pass key. Finally, they give us a nice uh, pass key that helps us, which is digging a hole for the foundation and whatnot is part of the cost of the land. Filling the hole, building the base of the building, building the foundation, the building and going up is part of the cost of the plant, part of the cost of the building. Okay. Um, I'm, I said that wrong. I said that incorrectly. My bad. I said it incorrectly. Flashcard the pass key. It's correct. I said it incorrectly. Getting the land nice and flat so you can begin building on it. Okay. Go with my visual there so you can begin building on it. Part of the cost of the land. Digging a hole for the building, the foundation, the landscaping, all of that stuff is a land improvement or part of the cost of the building. Okay. All right. Good. Now you come over and we talk about basket purchase. So you buy a piece of you buy a piece of land and it has a building on it. Well, how much of that transaction price that you paid for that land with the building? How much is land? How much is building? And you're going to have to allocate that as the accountant, as the CPA, because land is not depreciable, whereas a building would be. Okay. So what happens? Let's say you pay five hundred thousand dollars. and you've got land with a building on it. Now, what you do is you'd have an appraisal, an appraiser come in, and let's say the appraised, value of the land equals 100,000. The appraised value of the building equals 300,000, okay? So we obviously have a total here of what? 400,000 on the appraised values. The 500,000 then we would look and we'd say, okay, well, for the land, okay, for the land, it's all right, land over here. For land, 500,000 times what? A hundred thousand, which was the appraised value for the land, divided by the total of four hundred thousand, or what? Uh, I think that's one hundred and twenty-five thousand, if I'm doing my math correctly. Yes. So for the land for the building. Thank you. The five hundred thousand times what? Three hundred thousand of that total of four hundred thousand would go to the building and of course then be depreciated right now sometimes students will be like well why would we pay 500,000 if the appraised values well what they do in a case like that is they appraise that land as though it didn't have that particular building on it they appraise that building as though it was not on that particular piece of land and they come up with those separate appraised values and they could be different than when you combine those two when you put a restaurant building in a restaurant district, it's going to have a different value than if it was just a restaurant floating in space or if that land didn't have that restaurant on it. Okay. 
Okay, good. Now you come over and um, I guess you can flashcard that to allocate. Okay, and you'll see a couple of questions like that. I actually find those kind of questions kind of fun. Okay, let's go ahead and let's take a look at equipment. Equipment is similar to a building and then it's the invoice price. If there's any cash discounts, unlike a building, you don't have to pay freight in on that. Okay, whereas for a piece of equipment, you might pay the freight to get that. Okay, uh, any installation charges, excise tax. Okay, we'll talk about construction period interest here in a little while. But any cost that you incur to get that equipment to your business so you can use it productively in your business is part of the cost of that equipment. Okay, so you might want to flashcard a couple of these that may not jump to mind, such as the installation charges and the uh, excise tax. Um, one that I had a student actually ask me after she had already passed the CPA exam, came back and asked me, what should I do? Um, yeah, I'm working and we had to pay uh, the charge for disposal of computers. Um, they give you that environmental charge that you have to pay. What should we do with it? And I'm like, well, could you have bought the computer if you didn't pay that? No. Okay. Then it's part of the cost of the computer. Uh, it's not expense. It's part of the part of the cost of that equipment. Okay. Now, what they'll do in some um, questions on the exam is they're going to want to see, do you know, um, or, or part of the cost of the questions of cost of property plant equipment, I should say, do you know what you should do if there's an addition or an improvement or replacement versus a repair? Additions, improvements, replacements should be what? Should be capitalized. Whereas what? Repairs. Repairs will be expensed, okay? And we'll see that. And when we say repairs, we mean ordinary repairs. And I'll show you that a little bit later. Don't worry if you can, can't read that. It says repairs, but we're going to get into that a little bit later, okay? Or in fact, why don't we go ahead and take a look at some of this right now. So improvements. Improve the quality of the fixed asset and are capitalized to the fixed asset account, okay? A replacement, a replacement is also going to be what? Going to be capitalized. So improvements and replacements are capitalized. Now, when you make a replacement, let's talk about replacement, okay? Improvements, you add a wing to the building, that's capitalized. But let's talk about replacements, okay? They say, if the carrying amount of the old asset is no, remove it, recognize any gain, and capitalize the cost of the improvement to the asset account. Okay, flashcard that. If the carrying value of the old asset is unknown, and what should we do? Now, what do you mean the carrying value of the old asset is unknown? What does that mean? Well, how would that happen? Well, let's say, I'm going to shoot flashcard what you're to do here in these different circumstances. But let's say you buy a building and the building has a roof on it. You use that building for a couple of years and then you need to replace the roof. How much of the original cost of that building would have been attributed to the roof versus how much would have been attributed to the rest of the building? You said, I don't know, I paid a whole amount and the roof was on there, okay? So in that case, it could be that what? It could be that the value of the roof was unknown. So if the asset's life is extended, and I would say if you replace a roof on the building, you probably extend it its life, you would go and you would do this treatment, which I want you to flashcard, which is debit the accumulated depreciation and credit the cash that you paid the roofer to put the roof on there, accounts payable, whatever. Now, what happens when you do that, when you debit the accumulated depreciation, accumulated depreciation comes down, the carrying value of the building goes up, right? Okay. Now, they tell us that if the usefulness of the asset is increased, capitalize the cost by debiting the asset account, okay? So these are two options, whether it is known or whether it is unknown, okay? Uh, or And if it is unknown, then what? If it is unknown, then you have these two choices, which is to either debit the accumulated depreciation or debit the asset account. For example, 
you bought a truck, the truck had a engine in it, you know, a few years later, you have to replace the engine. Well, I don't know how much of the original cost was the engine, but now because I put a new engine, I'm going to be able to make deliveries uphill as opposed to before I was just using that down, you know, the flatlands when the, um, you know, when the engine was older. Well, then I'm, you know, making that up to say you've increased the usefulness, debit the asset account, credit the cash. Okay, those are the two alternatives if the carrying value of the old asset in improvement replacement is unknown. Okay, if we have repairs, ordinary repairs should be expense. Extraordinary repairs should be capitalized, for example, overhauling that engine. Okay, so you would look for those words ordinary versus extraordinary repairs in determining whether or not you should capitalize a repair or expense it. Okay, so when you look at that list of what we just went to through, it was what capitalize everything but ordinary repairs. And the only wrinkle we had is whether or not the value of the asset that we're replacing is known or not, and whether we would debit the accumulated depreciation. If the life of the asset is extended, we would debit the asset account if the usefulness was extended. Okay, I think we've got some good flashcards on that. We don't need to sit here and uh, go through that summary table. Now, what happens? Construction period interest. Let's take a look at that. Okay, what happens? The accounting standards allow us to capitalize some interest if we are constructing an asset. Okay, now it could be um, items that we are going to be uh, building for our own use, or it could be, for example, uh, something that we're going to sell to somebody else. Okay, but regardless, we are allowed to. Um, um, Okay, to be used internally, fixed assets intended for sale. Regardless, what we are going to be able to capitalize some of that interest. Okay, so we're building a building that we're going to use. Part of the cost of that building would be, uh, and we're borrowing some money to build that building. Some of that cost would be uh, that we'll capitalize in the building will be the interest cost. Um, we're building a cruise ship, we're a shipbuilder. And we're building it for, I don't know, is Royal Caribbean still in business, whatever, one of those kind of outfits. What happens? We can capitalize the interest on that item that we're building for them. Now, that's for construction that is being done by, by uh, specific um, requirements under contract. If I'm building routine inventory, I wouldn't capitalize the interest on that. Okay. Now, we come over, so it's got to be a discrete project. Okay. Now, in fact, why don't you go ahead and flashcard those two things as to when we would go ahead and capitalize interest. Now, when we capitalize the interest, we will use something called the weighted average of accumulated expenditures, okay? And we capitalize costs for a particular period, um, interest costs by using the weighted average of accumulated expenditures, uh, and we apply an interest rate to the weighted average of accumulated expenditures. Okay, now flashcard that we use weighted average of accumulated expenditures, but I want to go ahead and give you a little example here as to how you will calculate weighted average of accumulated expenditures. Okay, so let's say a company starts a project and on 1 1, okay, January 1st, they spend a hundred thousand on this construction project. Okay. Then on 6.30, they spend another 500,000. And then on 12.31, they spend another 100,000. Now that 100,000 would have been outstanding for what? The entire year. So to come up with a weighted average of accumulated expenditure, I'd multiply that by 12 over 12, gives me the 100,000. The 500,000 was only outstanding for what? Six months of the year. So I'd multiply that by six twelfths, that 500,000 multiplied by six twelfths, of course, gives me 250,000. And how long was the 100,000 outstanding? Guys, 
Just checking, sanity check, make sure you're not sleeping on me. How much was the, how long was the 100,000 outstanding? Zero. Good. That was outstanding for none of the year, right? Because it wasn't until 1231. So that would have an impact on the weighted average. Again, I'm calculating weighted average of accumulated expenditures here. Okay, I'm just showing you how you fix that, calculate that. So the weighted average of accumulated expenditures in this example would be 350,000. Okay. Now they tell me I have to apply an interest rate to that because I'm trying to get to the interest. The weighted average of accumulated expenditure is, I mean, they could ask you what is the weighted average of accumulated expenditure, but if they ask you what's the amount of interest to be calculated, then I'm going to have to look at the problem and see what interest rate they give me. And they probably will have more than one interest rate that I'm going to have to choose from in that problem. And so the interest rate that I would be using, okay, right here, is the interest that is related to the specific borrowing for that project. So they'll tell you they borrowed so much money for this project and the interest rate was 10%, just to make the numbers easy, you would take that 350,000, multiply that times a 10%. Now, there is a possibility that the weighted average of accumulated expenditures will exceed the amount of borrowing that we use. So our weighted average of accumulated expenditure was 350,000, but maybe we only borrowed 200,000. So what interest rate should we use in this example on that $150,000 excess, okay? And the interest rate that should be used would be the average interest rate for all other borrowings of the company. And guys, they will give you that number, okay? So you'll look at a question. They may or may not ask you to calculate the weighted average of accumulated expenditure. I've given an example of how you've done that. They'll give you an interest rate on the specific borrowing. You'll apply that um, to the weighted average of accumulated expenditures, unless the weighted average of accumulated expenditure exceeds that specific new borrowing, in which case you will then go ahead and have to look for a second interest rate in that problem. That second interest rate will be the one that you'll apply to that excess um, amount of um, weighted average of accumulated expenditures in excess of a specific new borrowing. You cannot exceed the actual interest cost for the period and do not reduce any capitalized interest uh, by interest revenue. If you had some money or something that wasn't being used uh, right away and you invested that and had an interest savings, you don't reduce that off the amount that would be capitalized. Okay, so you can see, guys, a bunch of flashcards here, but I think by doing that, um, it makes a question like this pretty easy. Let's look at this. So we've got this uh, fax January 1st, Convisor Soup Kitchen signed a fixed price contract to have a new kitchen built for a million dollars. On the same date, Convisor borrowed 500000 to finance the construction the loan is payable in 100,000 annual payments plus interest at 11%, okay? I know I've got to worry about that because I know that I have to apply that interest rate to my weighted average of accumulated expenditures, right? Okay, uh, at least up to the 500,000. Combiser plan to finance the balance of the construction cost during uh, costs using the company's existing debt which had an average rate of 9%. So they give me a second interest rate there. And they tell me that during year one, the weighted average of community expenditures was 600,000 and interest cost on all borrowings was 150,000. Now that 150,000 is going to be my cap. I cannot capitalize more than that, okay? So what happens? They spent what, six? The weighted average of accumulated expen um, the, excuse me, that was the weighted average of accumulated expenditures was six. The specific borrowing was five. So I'm limited to that five times the 11%. The remaining what? The remaining 100,000, I have to use that other interest rate, the 9%. I add those together. That's the amount I want to capitalize. It does not exceed what? The 150,000. So I've capitalized all of that. Okay, now I want you to flashcard what you would be doing. Okay, and uh, let's 
for the capitalization of that interest and uh, sometimes the problems will give you events and see if you should continue to capitalize interest or stop. So you start capitalizing interest if the expenditures for the assets have been made. That includes what? Um, you know, build uh, drawing blueprints for the building. Anything that you have to do to get that building started is part of that means that expenditures have begun and you should start capitalizing interest. Okay. Activities that are necessary to get the asset ready for its intended use are in progress. You have to have been incurring interest on that. So you've now borrowed the money, you're paying interest continues as long as those three are present. Stop capitalizing interest during intentional delays, but continue to capitalize during unintentional delays. So what happens? Intentional delay. I'm building homes and I have different phases and I finish phase one and I look at the housing market and I say, mm -mm, I'm going to stop right here for phase two because I don't think the price of the homes are going to be favorable. I'm going to wait for the market to improve. If you stop construction intentionally waiting for the market to improve, stop capitalizing the interest. Ordinary delay, look out your window right now. If, probably if you're anything like what it's looking like in Hayward right now, if uh, you know it's raining like this, construction stops, doesn't it? So that would be an unintentional delay. You can continue to capitalize interest during that time. Okay, and then once the asset is done, you stop capitalizing interest. So you've built all the homes and now you've got standing inventory of homes and what's happening. You continue to pay interest on a loan that you took off for those, whatever. You will stop capitalizing that interest and that will go all into expense. That's why I tell people sometimes it's favorable to walk into a housing development towards the end of the development because they want to get out of that project and onto another. And they start to cut you some pretty nice deals on as they try to sell that standing inventory because not only are they paying the, prop, um, the property tax on those that are standing, they're also incurring interest and their investors are going to start to say, hey, let's get out of this thing, stop incurring these interest expenses and move forward with the sale of these things. Okay. Okay, good. That is pretty much what I want to cover there, guys. I actually flashcard those rules. Okay. You can see it is a very, um, you know, rule laden area here. I gave you a bunch of flashcards, but not really, you know, terribly conceptually difficult. I'm not going to go through this example. You can skim this if you want to. All it does is say start during intentional delay. Then there was an unintentional delay. Continue to capitalize interest. I don't see a lot of value to that, to that example, but you can look at that if you want to. Okay, good. Let's go ahead then and let's take a look at a couple questions now that I'm going to ask you to work on your own. And then we'll, we'll throw them together. So I'm going to go ahead and put the poll up. Any questions, guys, on any of that? Got to solicit questions there. Okay, good. So I'm going to go ahead and launch the poll. And we can start to take a look at that.
Okay, that's a little more than I probably should have given you in that one because that's uh, two minutes and 30 seconds. There's no way this question should have taken a full uh, two minutes, but let's go ahead and let's take a look and see how we did. And um, yeah, most of us got this right, although I would have thought all of us would have got this right because I think it's a pretty straightforward question, but let's go ahead and uh, let's work through it together. So obviously we have to include the 400,000. I mean, we can't get to any of the answers. Invoice price on a tract of land, whatever the 400,000, we got to bring that in. Now, if we, again, trying to get the land nice and flat so we can begin building on it, then do we have to demolish any old building? Yeah. Okay, legal fees. Can you take the land if you don't pay the legal fees? No. Nope, they're gonna make you pay them. Try it sometime, okay? Uh, title guarantee insurance. Those title companies have their hand out. They're waiting for you, right? Okay. So, so far, we've capitalized everything. Proceeds from the sale of salvage. Well, we need to consider that, but that would be what? Deduction. That would be a subtract if you're able to sell that stuff. And what did we say the answer was A? That's how we came up with this 464000 Question? I mean, I think you'll see questions like this guy's piece of cake, okay? I would hope, uh, you know, I would be happy to hear that you got a bunch of these questions on your exam because they're very, very straightforward. They probably won't give you a bunch. They might give you a... When I took the exam, I was pleasantly surprised that there were more than I thought there were going to be. Um, but, you know, you might get three, maybe two or three of those. Okay. All right. Good. Let's go ahead then and let's take a look at this next question dealing with construction period interest. Okay, it's about two minutes, guys. I'm going to go ahead and end the poll on this one. And uh, let's take a look at how we did. Yeah, pretty good. Almost everybody got this one right. Okay, uh, the choice is B, but let's go ahead and let's uh, take a look at how we would have done this. Sorry, my mouse plays to play hide and seek with me. Um, so let's just go ahead and let's take a look. And what happens? They want to know how much should be capitalized during the year. We know that we have to use the weighted average of accumulated expenditure for that. 
Um, they didn't tell me that in the question, but we know from our flashcards that that would be the case. So we'd have to take what? We would take the million dollars that they spent on January 2nd, and we would consider that outstanding for the entire year. Guys, the exam doesn't get into fractions of months or anything on the exam, so you don't have to worry about that. So that would be what? A million dollars for questions like this. Okay, that would be a million dollars, right? And then they spent what? They spent another million on 1231. And uh, just like the little example I gave you, that would be what? That would be zero twelves. Okay, be careful. They spent on December 1st, then it's going to be what? One twelfth, right? So you'd have to look at that. But here, since it was, you know, um, the last day of the year, it wasn't outstanding at all. And then they have to give me an interest rate on this. And they tell me what there was 8% on this construction loan of uh, 3 million. And so what happens, we take that 8% times the 1 million, that's 80,000. Now, when I look at that, which was the correct answer, I'm just trying to figure out, they didn't tell me when they borrowed this money. 8% three-year construction loan of 3 million, but they don't tell me when they borrowed the money. Um, so that was a little confusing because I, I would need to know, you know, what the interest was on that. I mean, I guess if they borrowed the money on December 1st, it'd be what, 3 million times 8% times 112? What's that coming up to? Guys, 3 million times 8% times 112 is what? Come on, guys, don't sleep on me here. Three million times eight. 20,000. Huh? 20, is 20,000. Okay, so I don't know. If they borrowed the money on the last day of the year, then the actual interest expense would be zero. So to be perfect, this problem probably should have told me um, when they borrowed this money, but I think the problem was assuming that it was outstanding the whole year. And so the 80,000 would have been fine. Somebody can say something. <clears throat> so why, why you're calculating 20,000? Well, I'm just trying to figure out, they should have told me when they borrowed this money so I could figure out what the amount of interest, actual interest was because they have an 8% three-year construction loan, but they don't tell me what the actual interest expense was for the period because I'm capped at that. So I wanted to see if 20, if any of the choices came out when I just assumed one month, but it could have been zero months. I don't know when they borrowed this money. So I don't know what their actual interest expense is from looking at the facts of this problem. Someone is seeing something I'm not. Do you know what their actual interest was from this problem? No. I mean, I just quite literally just read the last four or five words of the last sentence, capitalized during the current year. And if you're not in offering any more information, just keep it simple. I mean, that's my rationale. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm probably, you're right, Cheryl, I'm probably overthinking this, but I think for this to be a perfect question, they should have at least told me when they borrowed this money, because if they borrowed on the last day of the year, then they have no interest costs, and I can't exceed that, but I guess I can't assume that. Since I can't assume that, I have to go with that the interest was outstanding for more than zero days or however many days would have kept them, you know. So so just going through your thoughts, I they could have not paid the one million in January second new basis borrowed at the end of the year. So my assumption was always that they had the loan before January first. Right, but they don't make that clear. Yeah. yeah. 
Because I don't know, maybe they were taking that million out of some other. But you're right. I guess they're saying that they borrowed that money for the construction. Anyway, we're probably spending too much time with that. But to be a better problem, they should have just told me when they borrowed the money. And then I wouldn't be bothered with this question. I have this feedback from Becker to consider. I don't know that this is a Becker question. This might be a CPA exam released question. They release so many questions each uh, year. So this might be one that was released and it's got that ambiguity. I would think if you got one like this, you know, you'd be advised to do it the way we did it than picking zero. It's clearly not C, it's clearly not D. Okay, all right. I don't know if I'm doing more harm or good with <laughs> more harm than good with that conversation. So let's move forward. Okay. All right, good. Let's go ahead then, guys, and let's start to take a look at depreciation, okay? And um, we're going to be looking at different depreciation methods here. Guys, I don't think you got this far if you don't know that some key things that you use in the calculation of depreciation is salvage value and estimated useful life, okay? Both of these are estimates, of course, okay? Um, and financial statements are full of estimates, we know. And so um, let's just go ahead and start to take a look at the different methods. And we talk about component versus um, composite depreciation, okay? Uh, when we're dealing with component, we will deal with uh, each item separately, okay? Um, and it's uh, permitted, but rarely used under U.S. GAAP, I guess, because companies are lazy, okay? Um, but think about it. If you had a building and you depreciate the entire building over 30 years, well, that's not a very accurate picture of the depreciation because what? Some parts of the building, like the roof, maybe will depreciate in 15 years, whereas the foundation of the building might last 50 years. So to get a more accurate depreciation if each piece of that building had its own depreciation schedule, you'd probably get a better uh, picture of what the depreciation is, okay? Now we can also have composite versus group depreciation, okay? Now, when we look at composite or uh, not versus, but composite or group depreciation, um, we're going to basically depreciate a group of items under a single life, say five years, whatever, okay? The asset retirement, when a group or composite asset is sold or retired, accumulated depreciation is treated differently than if it was a single asset. If the average service life of the group of the asset has not been reached, then when the asset is retired, the gain or loss that results is absorbed in the accumulated depreciation account, okay? So flashcard that. Okay, and let's just go ahead and let's take a look at this example. Okay, and we have this group of machines that they're depreciating. They're sitting there and they're saying, well, the depreciable cost, if you take the salvage value off for each one, is this. That's a total of 720. And what's going to happen? I'm going to divide that by the uh, average depreciation for these things, which I calculated to be a total 45,000, 500,000 divided by 20 and so on, 15 divided by five, that's 45,000. That means that the average composite life of this is 16 years. Now what happens in this particular example, they go ahead and they sell one of the items and they sell it in what? 10 years for 260. Well, obviously, if they sell it for 260, they debit cash 260, they're getting rid of that asset A, so they're going to credit it for the 550. That was its original cost. And rather than sitting there and calculating a gain or loss on that at that point in time, they will simply plug. And this is a true plug. There's not many things in accounting that are actually a plug. I can almost tell you how to calculate every piece of a journal entry. And we're talking about group or composite depreciation when you sell and you sell it under that average life, which in this example was 16 years, they sold it in 10 years, then you simply plug that difference to the accumulated depreciation. Okay, that is the takeaway. 
of that. You're like, huh? So the takeaway is that you would do that plug if they asked you something like that. Okay, basic depreciation methods. Guys, I'm not trying to insult anyone's intelligence. I think if you got this far, you know how to do straight line. Okay, so we would go ahead and take the what? Take the cost minus the salvage value divided by the years, 2000 per year. Okay, now where you need to be careful on the exam is they love to put assets in use in the middle of the year towards the last part of the year, the last month of the year or something. So if that's the case, you only take a partial year's depreciation. So they warned you of that up here, that the only way they make these you know, depreciation questions worthy of the exam is by putting assets in use after the year has started. They put it in use, what, December 1st, we're well, only gonna take a month of depreciation. They put it in use July 1st, you're going to take six months of a depreciation, but it is an easy mistake to make to miss that on the exam and then miss an easy question. OK, so make sure that anytime you get a, what seems like an easy straight line depreciation question, go back after you've chosen your answer. Go back and make sure you are satisfied that you know when that asset was put into use so that you don't make that mistake. OK. Okay, good. Now you come over and we talk about some of years digits. Okay, when I look at some of years digits, I'm always, you know, thinking it's kind of funny because whoever came up with this method had way too much time on their hands. So let's say it's a five year life. Okay, you'd add up year one plus year two plus year three plus year four plus year five gives you 15. Okay, and in year one, you would take what? You would take five fifteenths of whatever the depreciable base is. In year two, you would take what? Four fifteenths of the depreciable base. Year three, three fifteenths of the depreciable base. Year four, we do what? Two fifteenths. In year five, we would take one fifteenth, and by that last year, we would have taken 15 fifteenths. I mean, again, whoever thought of this was clearly couldn't get a date. Okay. So, what happens? What we would do is to come up with the uh, depreciable expense, we would go ahead and we would take what? We would take the cost minus the salvage value and then multiply times whatever the appropriate fraction is in whatever year, year two you'd go ahead and you multiply that times four fifteenths and so on, okay? Now, flashcard that, but also flashcard this formula, okay? And it's a simple little thing. It's not a big deal to figure out the sum of the digits, even though the CPA exam freak, uh, rarely goes beyond five years. I don't want you to run into some stupid question where they give you 50 years and you have to sit there and go one plus two plus three. If it's 47, 48, did I say 46? Let me go and start that over again. So if it's, you know, more than, say, five years, probably use this formula. Otherwise, you could just use on your calculator, one plus two plus three plus four plus five is 15. You're done pretty quickly, and you don't have to use this formula, okay? Now, when we look at this example, okay, we have what? We have the 11,000 cost. We take off the salvage value. That gives me a depreciable base of 10,000. Well, so far... That's just like straight line, right? But then instead of dividing it by the years, we're going to multiply it by the sum of digits. And in the first, that will be the denominator here, obviously. And that first year, we take four tenths, second year, three tenths, and so on. Now, a lot of times you'll see in a question, they'll say, just to make it a little bit interesting, what would be the carrying value of the asset at the end of year two? Now, the way I will do that is I'd say, well, look, I know I would have taken four tenths in year one and three tenths in year two. So that means that I would have depreciated what? Seven tenths off that 10,000. So that means that my depreciation by the end of year two would have accumulated to 7,000. So what's the book value at the end of year two? That's a question. 3,000. Huh? 3,000. Okay, good. Thank you for making that mistake, because that's what I was the objective of me asking you that. It would be what? 
the 11,000 cost minus what? Minus 7,000 that would have built up and accumulated appreciation by then. Okay, so I asked that question, um, Roy, if you don't mind me calling you out on that one uh, intentionally, because that's an easy mistake to make, right? So just oh, yeah, there's always value. Right, right. Okay, okay, good. That's an easy mistake to make. When I look at your homework questions, sometimes I do that for fun if I'm bored. And I always make that mistake. I always subtract it from the depreciable base as opposed to the original cost. So easy mistake to make. Just make sure you don't do that on the exam. Okay. Okay, good. Now, another way to calculate depreciation is to get to take cost minus salvage value. That's just like straight line, just like we've talked about for some of the years digits. But now we're going to divide it not by the years, but by the estimated hours we're going to use this piece of equipment the number of widgets that are gonna be produced, the number of miles we're gonna drive a vehicle. And that's gonna come up with a rate per unit, per hour, per mile, whatever it is. And then you simply do what? You simply multiply that rate times the number of hours, miles driven, units produced by that piece of machinery, whatever, that gives your depreciation expense. You know, that is probably the, best estimate of depreciation expense for a period because it's based on actual use. Most companies use straight line because they are saying, hey, I don't have any additional record keeping of the mileage or anything that I have to do. And so I'm just going to use straight line. But probably the you know most uh, you know accurate, if you will, the best estimate of depreciation expense would be based on the units of uh, output production, et cetera, okay? Now, what declining balance does, similar to some of your digits, is it says, well, look, since we're not really wanting to keep track of the hours, the miles driven on this piece of machinery, whatever, what if we came up with a method that sort of mimics how we actually use our assets? And most companies probably do what? probably use their assets a lot when it's new. I mean, think of you had a brand new delivery truck. You're going to use it a lot because it's new and you can make longer deliveries, uphill deliveries. And then, you know, towards the end of the life of that truck, you probably won't use it as much. So can we come up with something that has the simplicity of straight line, but gives the effect of a units of activity usage type of thing? Some of yours did just does that as does declining balance, okay? So when we talk about declining balance, okay, we often talk about double declining balance. Now, it does not have to be double. It could be triple, whatever. But what you do is you take the straight line and then you multiply it by whatever they're telling that multiple is. And a lot of times it is going to be double. Okay. Now, when you take a look at how to calculate the double declining balance depreciation, you do not use the salvage value in the calculation, but never depreciate below salvage value. You do not depreciate below salvage value. So whatever the salvage value is, you have to be aware of it. And as you apply the double declining balance percentage to that declining balance period after period, you don't use that in the calculate the, the salvage on the calculation, but you once you get to a year where you're going to your depreciation will take the carrying value of that asset below salvage value, you stop. Okay, so let's just go ahead and let's take a look at this. Okay, and uh, they have this piece of equipment that they bought, and it has a uh, cost of ten thousand. And it has a 10 year life and a salvage value of uh, 2000. Now, if it was what? A 10 year life, we would take one tenth per year. That's 10%. 10% divided by two is 20%. And since they told us it was double declining balance, we're going to use that 20%. They could have told us it was one and a half times. Okay, guys, if they did, then we would have taken. 15%, we would have taken 1.5 the straight line. So you take the straight line, multiply it by whatever multiple. If it was triple, then we would have multiplied it by three to take 30%. But this one was the typical case of double declining balance. We take the 10,000, we don't worry about the salvage value. We multiply that by the 20%. That gives me 2,000 the first year. 
Okay, 2,000 is subtracted from the 10,000. That means I have an 8,000 remaining balance. It's declined, okay, double declining balance. The balance is declining, so that next year now it's 8,000 times 20%. That means that I would have taken depreciation of 1,600 that next year. I take what? I take the 1,600 off of the 8,000. That gives me what? 6,400. I take that 6,400 times 20%. That gives me 1,280 the next year and so on. I'm not going to go through the whole table. You get it. Okay. Now, what happens? Notice that in that next year, they give me this um, declining balance here. And the declining balance now has gone from what? Uh, from, um, you know, from 622. Um, the remaining book value was 622 minus the uh, 524 gives me this 2098. Now, don't do this. The 2098 times 20% would give me what? Anybody got a number for me? Was it like 459 or something like that? 419. Somebody got a number there for me? 420. 420, okay. So that would give me roughly 420. But if I took the 420 depreciation, I would come down below salvage value. So that last year I do what? I only take that 98 and I stop. I do not depreciate any further. I stop at salvage value. Question. Okay, good. Again, partial year depreciation. I already had you flashcard that. If you put the asset in use, say July 1st, then six months. Guys, I am of the belief that you should count on your fingers for depreciation questions on the exam. Uh, when I was studying for the exam, I would be sitting there going, okay, all of July, all of August, all of September, all of October, all of November, all of December. Okay, that's six months. My dad would see me studying for the exam. Is it going to be a CPA that counts on your fingers? And I would tell him, yes, dad, get out of here. You don't know anything about accounting. For questions like this, I'm counting on my fingers to make sure I don't miss a month and mess up an easy question. Okay. Okay, good. Come over and um, let's just take a look at depletion. Okay. Now, when we deal with depletion, what's happening? Now we're looking at a piece of land and we're looking at it not for what we could put on top of the land, but what we can what? What we can take out of the land. And as we take some mineral or some natural resource out of that land, we're going to recognize a depletion cost, okay? Now, when we look at our depletion base, it's going to involve this flashcard down here, okay? So our depletion base is whatever it costs us to purchase that property, plus development cost. Look, you can't put a vacuum cleaner on top of the land to pull coal out of the land. You've got to do what? Build mining shafts and stuff. Well, you would add that to the cost of the purchase price of the land. Okay. Estimated restoration costs. The federal government comes in and they tell, and many state governments come in and they tell somebody like a coal miner, hey, you can't just leave a hole in the ground where you took all that coal out. You're going to have to sit there and you're going to have to restore that land and put some sort of recreation facility on top of it or something. Now, a lot of companies walk from that responsibility and the federal government really lacks teeth to go after companies that do that because you have states like West Virginia and Ohio and parts of Pennsylvania that they need in order to you know, control the Senate and that kind of thing. And so a lot of times they don't enforce those rules. Politics are terrible, dirty game, but they are supposed to restore that. So what would be their estimate to restore you add that to the cost? And then after you restore it, you know, you say, well, look, I just took a big hunk of, you know, out of the side of the hill here. And if you ever go on 580 in the East Bay, you see this huge housing area to your left. There are all kinds of houses and beautiful condos with nice views and stuff were put up there. Well, that was a quarry pit. They took a big chunk out of the side of the hill and then they sold it to some developer later to put condos and houses and stuff up in there. 
and so you would subtract whatever you think you can sell it for after you restore it from that depletable base. Okay, so you got that depletion base, what you paid, okay, what you had to do to get it ready to use, okay, and what you're gonna have to pay to restore it in the future, minus what you think you could sell it for. And then you divide that by the estimated recoverable units, whatever that is, that then gives you what? That gives you your unit depletion rate, okay? And then you take that unit depletion rate and you multiply it by the number of units you extracted. That's your total depletion, okay? Now, once you have that total depletion, okay, if the units extracted are not sold, you just have them sitting in a pile waiting for somebody to come and buy this coal or iron or whatever it is you took out, then you would have to allocate the depletion between what you did sell the cost of is sold and inventory. Okay, and the amount of depletion um, is calculated, uh, it, that is included cost of sold is calculated by multiplying the unit depletion by the units sold. And then the units that are not sold obviously would be sitting in the ending inventory. Okay. Okay, good. So go ahead and flashcard that because they do like to sometimes break that out as to what is cost of goods sold versus what is inventory. But let's just go ahead and let's take a look at this example. Okay. So you've got this happy mining company, and I'm just going to go straight down to the solution guys here. They paid four million for this. Uh, actually, they didn't pay four million. They paid three point four million. That's the cost of the land. They paid development cost of eight hundred thousand. They estimate the restoration is zero, so they must know something about the federal government too. Or maybe they're doing this in a state like Ohio, where they're just going to walk from the mess when they're done. And then um, they go ahead and they would subtract the residual value, that gives me a, that's that total, a depreciable base of 4 million. They think they can take 4 million tons. Okay, that's just coming straight from the problem up here. And so what happens? It's a dollar per ton. If 375,000 units, okay, during the year, 370,000 tons were sold and they did what? they removed 400,000, then the total depletion is 4 million. The cost of goods sold is what? 375, and the ending inventory would be the remaining 25,000. So you need to look at the question. If they're asking you, you know, what should be the inventory? You'd have to take whatever they sold minus what they removed. That would be the number of units times that uh, cost per, whatever it is, ton, pound, whatever it is. And that's how you come up with the ending inventory. Okay. Okay, good. Let's go ahead. I guess this is a good pass key. I don't know. You know, you could use the mnemonic reel, but I gave you a flat card as to how to handle that depletion, depletionable base. Okay, good. Let's go ahead and let's take a look at a couple questions here.
Okay, guys, we're coming up on two minutes, so I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. So please make your selection. Okay, and um, we take a look, and uh, pretty good. Uh, most of us got this right. A couple of us maybe struggled a little bit. Uh, so let's just go ahead and see what's going on with this and take a look at it together. Okay, so what happens? I've got this company that paid a hundred thousand for a piece of equipment. Well, I know at least for the first year, I'm going to need to use that hundred thousand. So I write that down. Equipment had a useful life of what? Of ten years. So I would take what? One tenth per year. But they decide to use two hundred percent. Two hundred percent is double, isn't it? Okay. So instead of taking what? Instead of taking 10% per year, I'm going to double that and I'm going to take what? 20% per year. Okay. And they want to know what should be the depreciation expense in year two. So I'm going to have to go. Remember, we went through that table and I stopped. We're going to have to go through. And on the exam, they might ask you to go through a couple of years. Okay. They're not going to ask you to do, you know, 10 years worth on something like this, but they go ahead. And we multiply that times what? 0. 0.20. That means for year one, the depreciation equals what? 20,000. We take that 20,000 from year one. We subtract it from the beginning of year one. That gives me what? 80,000. And we would multiply that declining balance, double the declining balance. We'd multiply that declining balance by 20% in that second year. That gives me the 16, uh, not 1,600, but 16,000. Question? Most of us got that right. Okay, good. Let's try the next one. My mouse is playing hide and seek with me again. Okay, guys, we're at the two minute mark. I'll give you another 30 seconds on this one.
Okay, I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. So please make your best selection. Okay, and let's go ahead and let's take a look at this one. Okay, and most of us got this right. Okay, a couple of us had a little bit of trouble with it, but let's go ahead and take a look. The answer here is B. So let's take a look at this one. And do I need to pick up this 2640000 to come up with the, the first thing I'm going to do is come up with the depletion rate. I know I have to deal with that. So I'm just going to put that down to it. Okay. Now I know that after I figure this all out, I'm going to, what cost to include, I'm going to divide it by what? The 1,200,000 tons. Okay. So I pick that number up. Um, we will be required by law to restore the land to its original condition, a cost of 180. Should I pick that up? Yes. Yep, got to pick that up. Um, the Office of Surface Mining is the federal agency that's supposed to enforce those laws. They don't do a very good job. I was on an assignment where we looked at that and it was just ridiculous what they were doing anyway, but they were bound by certain uh, legal um, requirements that Congress had put in there, mainly because West Virginia and Pennsylvania and Ohio and states that have hardly no people have to, well, Pennsylvania's got a lot of people, but those states that have our, they both get two senators. Anyway, so Borst uh, believes that it would be able to sell the property afterward for 300,000 but they incurred what 360 of development costs. So just so I keep all my pluses together, I'm going to bring in that 360, and then I'm going to do what? Subtract the 300 because they can sell it after that. Yes. Okay. So when I do the math on that, I be I come up with a uh, depletable base of uh, I'm seeing by my earlier calculations, two million. 880,000. Yes. I divide that by 1.2 and I come up with what? $2.40 per ton. Now, I have a little problem with the way they phrase this question. Um, they tell us that what? Um, the, uh, they, they removed and sold 60,000 tons. So what should it report on its income statement um, as depletion? In other words, cost of goods sold, right? The way they worded that was a little weird. But since they removed and sold 60,000 tons, 60,000 times the 240 gave me the correct answer of 144,000. Okay, question. Okay, so I think you're seeing for the fixed assets, for the depletion, for the depreciation, et cetera, not terribly difficult stuff, okay? Uh, so I think you'll be in good shape to get a lot of nice points out of that conversation. When we come back, we are going to uh, continue on with this chapter and start to take a look at mon non-monetary transactions. I'm showing pretty much 6.30 now, so we will reconvene at 6.40. I'm going to pause the recording. Um, if I forget to start it again, somebody yell at me and tell me to start it up again. And we'll see in a little while after your break. The recording. And we are going to go ahead now and jump into module six, looking at non-monetary transactions. Um, non-monetary transactions, you know, the examiners could ask a part of a task-based simulation on this. And so we're going to see uh, that there's some examples of journal entries in here that um, I'm going to go ahead and ask you to flashcard some of the journal entries associated with this, uh, just in case um, we were asked a um, task-based simulation, which they asked me to do some journal entries. And I'm trying to figure out why it's so dark in here. And I just figured yeah. out it would help if I turned the light on. Okay. Things a little better, I think. Okay. And um, when we take a look 
and we have um, transactions that are non-monetary. They fall in one of two categories. They either have commercial substance or they lack commercial substance. Now, they tell us that a transaction has commercial substance if the future, future cash flows will change as a result of the transaction. So flashcard then, but when you look at CPA exam questions, they're either going to tell you that the transaction has commercial substance, or they'll say cash flows will change significantly as a result of the transaction, which means it has commercial substance, or if they are silent on both those points, which really should not be the case, but include your on your flashcard, or we are exchanging dissimilar assets, dissimilar assets. So we're going to be giving up a car in exchange for a building or something like that. And if you think about that, that's consistent with the cash flows changing significantly because the cash flows you would generate off a fleet of vehicles is different than the cash flows you'd probably generate off of a building. Okay. Now, when the transaction has commercial substance, we will recognize gains and losses, but you always recognize losses, don't you? Rule of conservatism. You always recognize losses whether the transaction has commercial substance or not. Okay, so the key thing is what? That we know that we will recognize gains in transactions that have commercial substance. Okay, where we are in, in non-monetary transactions that have commercial substance. So let's just go ahead and take a look at that. You can flashcard, I guess, that you should recognize the gains. Always recognize losses. If you see a situation where there's a loss on an exchange, you recognize it immediately. I don't care if the transaction has commercial substance or not. But for the gain, you have to say, well, does it have commercial substance? What are the rules? The problem will either tell me it has commercial substance. It'll say the cash flow has changed significantly or in the absence of either of those pieces of information, which frankly, the problem should give you one or the other of those then you would default to this dissimilar asset idea, okay? But let's go ahead and let's just look at this example. And Foxy Exchange, uh, exchange uh, used cars for building that uh, could possibly become Foxy's company storage space. Future cash changes will significantly change. Ding, we have a transaction that's commercial substance. We're going to calculate the gain here. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to flashcard these facts, okay? Flashcard these facts with the required. And then I want you to be able to pull out a flashcard. I mean, pull out a piece of scratch paper when you're going through your flashcards and calculate the game based on this fact pattern, okay? So what happens? The cars had an original cost of 102, accumulated depreciation of 62, so the book value of the cars was 40,000. Their fair value was what? Was 45,000. So that means we have a $5,000 gain. Not bad, okay? Then they want us to calculate the, or prepare, I guess not calculate a journal entry, but you prepare a journal entry based on that, okay? And one of the first things you want to do is be able to calculate the basis. Well, I shouldn't say it's one of the first things you want to do. Let's look at the journal entry first. Okay, so go ahead and make another flashcard now that would go ahead and ask you to calculate the um, value of the building, but uh, the journal entry, okay, to record the exchange. Okay, so I want you to again, have a flashcard in the middle of your flashcards. It'll ask you to do this. You break out a piece of paper, prepare the journal entry, compare it to the answer that's on the flip side. Again, I am giving you muscle tissue that will be useful if they ask you task-based simulation in this area. Okay, and you'll see a task-based simulation example in your homework as well for this, okay? But what I'm going to do here is I want you to number the journal entry in the order that you would put together journal entries. What happens a lot of times when a CPA exam question asks my students for a journal entry, you freeze because you can't think of the first line of the journal entry, what should be the debit, whatever, and you freeze. You don't have to put together the journal entry in the order of debits first, credits this, after first debit this, before I can credit that. 
you can figure out whatever's easiest for you first. Okay, so since the cars cost one hundred and two thousand, they're getting rid of them. You would credit the cars if you are getting rid of the accumulated depreciation. Since as you debit depreciation expense credit accumulated depreciation, that would have a credit balance. You debit it to get rid of that accumulated depreciation. Okay. Then you would go ahead, and since they said that they had to pay cash of twenty thousand, you know you have to credit the cash for three thousand. We just calculated the gain. That's the difference between the fair value and the book value of the asset that's being surrendered. That they just gave us, so we know we have to credit that gain. The last thing you would do in this journal entry is the building. Now. That's if they ask you for the whole journal entry, okay? That's the order you'd put that journal entry together, okay? But if they don't ask you for the whole journal entry, they just ask you for the value of the building, like this required up here, I don't want you to have to make a whole journal entry for that. So I'm going to have you flashcard a rule, okay? And the rule is the carrying value. of the new asset acquired equals the book value of assets given plus any gain or minus any loss. And of course, it can't be both a gain and a loss. It has to be one or the other. Flashcard, carrying value of new asset acquired equals the book value of the asset given up plus any gain or minus any loss. And we're going to continue to use that rule as we go through different scenarios, okay? Let's try it for this one, see if we come up with the right answer. What was the book value of the cars? What I do, catch you napping? One, huh? 102. What was the book value of the cars? 102 minus uh, depreciation. 40. 40,000. What was the book value? Is cash an asset? Is cash an asset? Yes. Did you give up the cash? Give up cash of 20. Okay. Was there any gain? Five. 65,000 is what the building should come on at? Okay. Yes. Okay, good. Now, they change the fact pattern up a little bit and they say, pretend that the fair value of the cars was 38,000. Well, if that's the case, we have what? A $2,000 loss. So we would take what? We would take the 40,000 plus the 20 minus the loss of two. Does that give me 58? Yes. Okay. Okay. Flashcard that we're going to see that that rule applies pretty consistently. We're going to see that we're going to have a transaction that lacks commercial substance and how we treat the gain is going to be a little bit funny. And we're going to have to kind of, kind of massage that rule a little bit to make it work, to make us see how it works, I should say, or we're gonna have to twist our head a little bit to make us see how that rule works, but it is consistent and is a good rule to have flashcarded, okay? Okay, good. Now, you come over and you take a look at exchange lacking commercial substance. I'm not particularly in love with the way Becker's put this stuff together, okay? So I'm gonna kind of have to jump around a little bit, guys, to get through this. But um, if a transaction is considered to lack commercial substance, if cash flows will not change, 
significantly as a result of the transaction. So CPA problem would have to say that, or it would say to you, um, the transaction lacks commercial substance. It'll just say that to you. Or in the absence of those two pieces of information, we are going to be exchanging what? Similar assets. Okay, so if you look at a question, they don't say, hey, it lacks commercial substance, or they don't say that cash flows will not significantly change the result of the transaction. You say, well, what is it? Is it lacking commercial substance or not? Then if it's similar assets, you could probably assume that it lacks commercial substance. Hopefully they won't do that to you. Okay, now what happens? Boot is otherwise known as what? Cash. Okay, so if no boot, no cash is involved, there will be no gain. Okay, if the exchange lacks commercial substance, no boot is involved, period, there is no gain recognized. Flashcard that. Okay, now if boot becomes involved, you will either pay the boot or you will receive the boot, right? Now, if the boot is 25% or more of the total consideration, flashcard that both the both parties will recognize any gains. And of course, losses are always recognized. So if the boot is more than 25% of the total consideration that's involved, don't ask yourself another question. Both parties recognize the entire gain. Now, what happens if boot starts being involved and it is less than 25% of the total consideration. If the boot is being paid and it constitutes less than 25% of the total consideration, no gain is recognized. Flashcard that. If boot becomes involved and the boot is being received, now let's think about this for a minute. If the boot is being received, you're already turning what? turning some of that asset that you're giving in to cash. So you've already started to change the cash flows, but not entirely. So what they do is they tell you if boot is less than 25% of the total consideration, then we will go ahead and take a gain, but the gain is going to be based on the proportional amount of the ratio between the boot received in the numerator and the total consideration received in the denominator, whatever percentage that is, it obviously would be less than 25%. We'll multiply that times the total gain, and that's the portion of the gain that we will take, okay? So again, the 25% rule, the way they're showing it here, you see 25%, don't ask yourself another question, both parties take the entire gain, okay? If boot starts to be less than the 25%, then what? then you will go ahead and you will take a proportional gain with the amount of boot in the numerator, the total consideration in the denominator, and that's the portion of the gain you will take. And if no boots involved, no gain. Always take losses. There is nothing else you have to ask yourself. If it's a loss, take the entire loss. I don't care if the transaction has commercial substance or not. Okay. Okay, good. Now let's go ahead. And let's just look at a couple questions, okay? And give quite a couple examples. And, you know, this is a little annoying because it's kind of like a movie title that tells you the hero dies, whatever. So no boot, we know no boot, no gain, okay? So machine A is exchanged for machine B. Machine A has a carrying value of 10 and a fair value of 12. Now there is an implied gain here, which is what? which is 2000, right? The fair value versus the book value. So there's a gain here, right, of 2000, but I'm not gonna take any of that gain because what? There is no um, boot involved. There's no cash involved in this transaction. So I won't take any of it. The gain is not recognized. Okay. Because uh, the change X and lacks commercial substance. Now, um, in this problem, they, in this example, they tell you the value machine B. If they didn't tell me the value machine B, could I calculate it anyway? 
Could I figure it out anyway what the fair value machine B was if they didn't give it to me? Yes, because it's the same. It's an exchange with no boot. Okay, well, I'm not sure if you're saying what I'm thinking. Okay, so let me tell you what I'm thinking. Okay, which is, look, nobody's on crack on the CPA exam. Okay, nobody's saying, well, look, uh, I need some money real quick or I need something real quick. So uh, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a uh, machine A that has a fair value of 12 and give me machine B that has a fair value that's less than that. And the person that's giving up machine B is going to give you a fair value machine that has more value than the machine A they're getting. So you would leverage off of what? Well, since they're giving me machine A that's worth 12,000, there's no cash involved, then machine B must be worth 12,000, right? Okay, so what happens? I'm not going to recognize any gain. What's the rule? You bring the new equipment on at the book value of the asset surrendered. What was the book value of the asset surrendered? 10,000. So I credit the 10,000 to take machine A off the books. I debit machine B for 10,000. I bring it on on the book value of the asset I gave up, which was machine B. I mean, which was machine A, excuse me. Question. Okay, good. Now I come over and boot uh, is paid. And the boot paid is less than 25%. So what's going to happen? Well, since I'm paying boot and it's less than 25%, no gain. When I'm less than 25%, I only take a gain if what? If boot is received, right? Now, once I exceed the 25%, it doesn't matter. Both parties, whether you're receiving the boot or paying the boot, will take entire gains on the transaction. So now what happens? Machine A is exchanged for machine uh, B, uh, and I have to pay $2,500. Machine A has a carrying value of 10, fair value of 12. They tell me machine B has a value of 14.5. Could have I have calculated that? How do I have calculated that if they didn't give it to me? The question asked That's me, what is the fair value machine right. B? The 12,000 plus the book. Right, the what? The book, um, the fair value, excuse me, fair value of machine A, which equals 12,000 plus the what? Plus the cash of 2,500. Machine B must be worth 14.5 because when I tried to just give the guy a machine, uh, you know, uh, A, he said, no, I want $2,500, right? So that brought him up to the fair value, okay? A machine B, good. Now, what happens? We take a look and we say calculate the gain and the answer is what? the gain is no gain because boot was paid. So even though there's an implied gain of 2000, which, you know, I don't know why they had to include the boot on that. I would have just looked at it, the book value, the fair value of machine A, which was 12, fair value of Mac A, versus the book value of Mac A, which was 10,000. Okay, so 12,000 minus the 10,000 is the $2,000 implied gain is the way I would have looked at that. Okay, but I'm not, bottom line, you know, I'm not going to take any of it because what? Because boot was paid and it was less than 25%. So the rule is bring the new asset, machine B in this case, on at the book value of the asset surrendered. Book value of the machine A was 10. Book value of the cash was 25. So they brought that new machine B on at 12.5. So that rule still holds. Okay. Now, what's happening? Now we're in a situation where boot is received and we're less than 25%. So now the entity that receives the boot will have to take a portion of that gain, okay? So what happens? Machine A's carrying value is 10. 
Machine A's uh, fair value, machine's book value, carrying value is 10. Machine A's fair value is 12, okay? We have what? We have an implied total gain here of 2,000, right? Now they give me machine B. Can you calculate that? Paulina, since you've been doing that for us, what do you think? Sorry, I lost you there. <laughs> Can you get the fair value machine B from this fact pattern? I mean, I know they're giving it to us, but what if they didn't? What if you had a CPA exam question that just asked you, what's the fair value machine B? And all they gave you was these three. What would you do? So it's the 12,000 minus the 2,500 because you're giving up machine A for the fair value of 12,000. And you're giving a book on it right. or you're receiving right. you're, you're receiving. Yeah. Fair value machine A is 12. The cash that you're getting is what? Is 2,500. So someone said, hey, I'll give you this machine B. He said, forget that. I'm not giving you machine A, which is fair value of 12 uh, for just, uh, you know, that stupid machine B. I want some cash. So that means that machine B's fair value must only be what? 9,500? Right. Okay. Okay. Good. But now I have to figure out. Well, um, should I recognize any gain on this because I am receiving some boo? Right. So what amount of gain am I going to take on this? So now you would go ahead and you would say, Well, look, um, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to say, Well, twenty five hundred dollars is the cash, the boo. And the total consideration I received here is what? Is 2,500 plus what? Plus the 9.5 for machine B. I mean, the fair value of the cash is the amount of cash. Right. So when you do that, you get what? 17% give or take. Okay. Uh, no, not is it 17%? Yeah, you get 17%. So what happens? I will now be able to take a portion of that gain. Where am I getting 17% from? What did I do? Where are they getting 21%? Huh? Okay, I, I, I yeah, it's twenty one percent to twenty five hundred over twelve thousand. Yeah, but it should be uh, I way I do it is oh yeah over twelve thousand. Thank you. I don't know where I'm getting twenty one percent from. Okay, thank you. It's over to twelve thousand. Okay, that's twelve thousand. Thank you. So you say that's twenty one percent. Yes. I don't know where I got seventeen percent from. Anyway. We are what we are under the 25 percent. I just want to strike that out to say we can be doing that another time. I see what happened. Okay. Okay, good. Okay, so now what am I going to do on this thing? Well, now I'm going to sit there. Oh, I know. Yeah. So now I'm going to take that 21%. Thank you. Looking at this. So now I take what? Now I take that gain of 2000. And I multiply this by what? I know what it was that I was trying to do before. By 21%, that gives me what? 417, okay, which you can see right there, okay. Now, when you put together the journal entry, okay, you would know that what? That machine A is coming off at its book value of one. You're receiving the cash, so that would be easy. You just calculated the gain using that uh, proportional rule that we just talked about there. And the book says plug 
I don't agree that it's necessarily a plug. The way I would look at it, the rule is the book value of the assets that you gave up, okay? So machine A's book value equals 10,000, right? And then the way I like to look at it is, well, but I turned some of that machine into cash, didn't I? So I would go ahead and I would subtract the part of the asset I gave up for the cash I received back. And then the rule was what? Plus any gain, that rule that I had you flashcard earlier, which was 417. Do you come up with that same number that they have up there, which is 7917? Okay, so if you apply that rule, the book value of the assets given up, but in effect, you gave net assets up of what? Of the 2,500 minus, uh, the 10,000 minus the 2,500 net, that's the book value of the assets you gave up. And then you add the gain going back to the rule we were using earlier. Okay, now, um, what I was thinking here where I, that 17% came from. Um, what I was trying to do there is I said, well, look, $2,500 was the um, amount of cash that they got. Just going back up here where that 17% came into play was the 2,500. And then um, the total consideration in this case though was what was the 2500 plus um um the total consideration was this 145 and when you take the 2500 divided by the 145 what do you get 17 17 percent okay and because we're what we're under the 25 percent nobody takes the gain because remember if you start to go over 25 percent who takes the gain if you go over 25 percent who takes the gain both of parties everybody so even so you got to be careful because that you'll see question in the in your homework we'll get confused because you'll say well wait a minute Cash was paid, so why are they taking a gain? And the answer is they must have exceeded the 25%. Okay, question on that? Okay, good. Now. So I have. An, yeah. An idea. Yeah. Um, because you're calculating, uh, calculating the percentages for machine A and B, right? That's the difference between the 21% and the. 17%. So the 21% was the 2,500 over 12,000, and the 17 is the 12,500 over the 14,500. Right, because in this case, the total consideration would have been the 12,5 plus the, uh, the, where am I getting that? I've only done this question a million times and now for some reason I'm drawing a blank on it. It's machine A's fair value because I'm giving up machine A, which has a fair value of 12, mm -hmm. plus the cash's fair value of 2,500, right? So mm -hmm. of the total consideration, the cash makes up 2,500 of that. That's where the 17 is coming from. Because I'm giving up machine A that has a fair value of um, 12. Mm -hmm. Well, machine A's fair value is 12, right? And I'm giving up cash that has a fair value of 2,500, right? Mm -hmm. So the total consideration there is 14,500, of which the cash only makes up 2,500 of that. Hello? So yes. when we're calculating the percentage, yeah. it has to be based on? The total consideration. So to get this machine B, I'm giving up total consideration of what? Of machine A that's 12. 
and cash that's 25, right? But when boot is paid, which is the case here, I only take the gain if the cash constitutes um, more than 25% of the total consideration, which it does not. So they didn't take any gain. What's machine A's fair value? Machine A fair value is 12. 12. What's the cash's fair value? 1,500. What's the total consideration? Uh, 14,500 for... For a machine B. For machine B. Right. So I gave up stuff that had fair value of 145 the cash only constituted 2,500 that are 17%. And the rule is that if the, if you're paying the boot and the consideration is less than 25%, you don't take any gain, right? Okay. So I'm just telling you the re they just kind of jump to, what I'm trying to get at is they just say, don't take a gain because um boot was paid that's not right if the boot that's paid constitutes more than 25 percent of the total consideration then both parties take the entire gain don't they right so that's what i was saying when the 25 percent for boot is if, if boot is over 25 percent when paid so the 25 percent is stop stop no once the consideration is more than 25 percent both sides take the entire gain whether you paid the boot or you received the boot if you're below the 25 percent you paid the boot you don't take any gain if you're below the 25 percent and you receive the boot you take a portion of the gain proportional to the amount of boot that you got to the total consideration Okay, so the total consideration will always be the amount of the asset that high, has the highest value. I, I, I don't think so, no. It's whatever the total consideration was, which I got cash. The consideration was cash plus the machine, right? Yeah. yeah. Here, I gave cash. So to get the total consideration, I had to add the cash to what I gave up. Here, I got a machine and I got cash. So I use the cash up here, right? Well, look, work with it on homework questions and you'll see what I'm talking yeah. about. When you get a question where they don't, where the consideration received is less than 21% and they're going, I mean, is more than 25%, I should say, and they're going to take the game. And then you're going to be like, oh, okay. That's why John stopped to do that. Because the way the book makes it sound is as long as you're under 25% and boot is paid, don't take any gain. And that's not right. Okay. Or as long as boot is paid, I should say, don't take any gain. And that's not right. There are instances where if the boot is more than 25%, everybody takes the entire gain. Okay. All right, so that's all the time I'm going to spend on that because we got to move forward. So let's come over. I mean, I, I'm I'm a little confused, Paulina. Why are you not seeing the point that I'm making here? Uh, I'll make. What are I'll you work on the, I'll yeah, work on the home. Yeah, again, I'm just telling you that if again, if boot is paid don't just go with this idea that because boot is paid no gain is recognized if boot is paid and the boot paid constitutes more than 25 percent of the total consideration then you do take the game right the entire game yeah that's mm -hmm. all i'm trying to say here okay all right good okay so let's go ahead and let's move on we don't need to look at that last example kind of Belabor is a point that I think we understand now. So uh, just quickly, if there's an involuntary conversion, okay, um, somebody says, hey, we're going to take over the land or whatever, and we give you 100000 
and the thing that they're taking from us has a value of 75,000, excuse me, a book value of 75,000, then we would consider that in that case a gain. If they took you know, the building from us and gave us less cash, that probably shouldn't happen, then of course that would be a loss. Okay, okay, good. When I say that shouldn't happen in real life, that shouldn't happen, but if it did, it would be a loss. Okay, good. Let's go ahead then and let's take a look at a couple questions here. Okay, guys, we're coming up on uh, three minutes for this question. We're at two minutes and 30 seconds. This question should probably take you no more than two minutes on the exam. But uh, since we're just now starting to practice with this stuff, I'm going to go ahead and uh, give you a little more time. Okay, and um, so I'm going to end the poll. And um, most of us got this right, okay, which is answer A, 67%. But let's go ahead and let's take a look at this. We got some people coming in for B, some people coming in for C, but the right answer was uh, A. Okay, well, let's just let, take a look at this. And just peeking down a little bit here, when you look, notice that it says that the transaction has commercial substance. So if it has commercial substance, will I be taking any gain? Yes. Yes, I'm going to take the gain. And they're telling me that they want to figure out what should be uh, on the balance sheet as investment. So in this problem, they were giving up a truck and they were receiving what? Stock back. So they're saying the, in, the asset that you're acquiring, what should you bring it on at? And so we know that the rule is the book value of assets given up plus any gain, and we know that we will take a gain or minus any loss if the book value of the asset we're giving up has an amount that is less than the fair value. So I start looking at this and they say, well, they gave up a truck for the stock. 
And on that date, the truck had a carrying value of 2,500 and a fair value of 3,000. So is there a gain on that truck? Is there a gain on that truck? Yes. Okay, good. So the fair value of the truck is what is three. The book value is 25. So I have a gain of 500. I know I have to take that. Okay. And then I'm sitting there and they say some information that is a distractor. Also, I'm striking it out because it's a distractor. Okay. And we picked up these 250 shares, the book value, blah, blah, blah. But then it says, what should Balt report December 31st as the investment in ACE? Well, it was the gain plus what? Plus the book value of the asset surrendered, which was the truck. So the truck would come on, I mean, the stock would come on at 3,000, wouldn't it? And I'd go ahead and I would uh, have to credit the gain, credit the truck for 25 and debit the um, stock investment for three. Question. Okay, good. Let's go ahead and let's take a look at this one. Again, that flashcard, what, you know, and you notice here, guys, that they can put all kinds of nonsense in there that has nothing to do with what you need to do to solve the problem. What was the book value of the assets that were surrendered plus any gain or minus any loss? Okay, good. Let's go ahead and let's take a look at this one. Question two. Put the poll on. Okay, let's go ahead and let's take a look at this one. And they ask us, we have a, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll and share the results. And most of us got it right, okay? Um, but let's just take a look at this one together. And there is a little test taking technique going on here. So a transaction was reported in non-monetary exchange of assets. Under which of the following circumstances would the transaction be measured? 
based on the reported amount of the non-monetary asset surrendered, the non-monetary asset surrendered. Now, if we're just basing it off of the non-monetary asset surrendered, the book value, and it doesn't say there plus any gain or minus any loss, that means there's what? No gain or loss on that transaction because they're just saying the book value of the asset surrendered. So this must be a transaction that lacks commercial substance, right? Because they're not telling me to worry about any gain or loss. We're just worried about the book value, machine A, 10,000, machine B, 10,000. We just brought machine B on the book value machine A, and there was no um, gain or loss contemplated because the transaction lacked commercial substance. Okay. Now, that's one way to look at it. The other way to look at this question, when cash flows are expected to change the result of the exchange, um, that means that the transaction has commercial substance, doesn't it? Guys? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And in B, it says when the timing of future cash flows of the asset differs significantly, which is another way of saying cash flows are expected to change. Yes. So A and B are the same thing, aren't they? And then when the transaction has commercial substance, which is basically what A, B, A and B are describing, can there be three right answers to a question? No. Okay, so you could have got it that way. But again, that one flashcard that I had you put, when we are calculating the value of the new asset, it's what? It's the book value of the asset surrendered plus any gain or minus any loss. And if it's just the book value, that means is what they said in this problem. That means that there is no what? There is no gain or loss to contemplate. That means the transaction lacks commercial substance. Okay. Okay, good. Let's take a look at intangible. Now, um, intangible assets, okay? And there are a couple of different types of intangible assets, okay? Those are those that are specifically identifiable. Trademarks, et cetera, are specifically identifiable. Goodwill is not specifically identifiable, okay? So um, in other words, goodwill, you can't point to a patent or something like that, okay? Now, how should we account for intangible assets? And if you pick up the financial statements of a company and they are reporting an intangible asset, that means that they acquired that from another entity. Flash card that. The cost to internally develop an intangible asset, research and development cost, et cetera, are expensed goodwill from advertising not only can you not create goodwill you cannot make goodwill gooder so you'll see some questions and they'll say well they uh, had recorded some goodwill because they acquired it in an acquisition of another company and then they launched an advertising campaign of five hundred thousand to improve the goodwill and the advertising would be expensed okay Okay, good. Now, there are exceptions to that general rule. Let's flashcard the general rule. So the general rule is what? The cost to internally develop an intangible is expensed. You only capitalize it if you purchase it from another. The exceptions to that is if you have to pay legal fees to successfully defend your right to a patent. So I've been expensing this money to defend the patent, to uh, develop the patent, and then someone challenges me on my rights to the patent. I have the legal fees that I incur, I could capitalize that, okay? Regist registration or consulting fees, design cost, why don't you just go ahead and flashcard those three because the other one is just sort of an obligatory other direct cost to secure the asset. I guess you can put that on a flashcard if they threw something like that on, you would capitalize that, okay? Now what happens? Once you have capitalized the cost, you have to amortize, okay? And the method that you will use to amortize, that's another word for depreciation, but for intangibles, we don't call it um, 
depreciation, we call it amortization, okay? Now, when we amortize fixed assets, we don't amortize goodwill. Goodwill, and we'll talk about that in F4, goodwill, um, we have to evaluate it for impairment, but we don't amortize it. All other intangibles are amortized, and they're amortized over the shorter of the useful life or the remaining life. Okay. Um, oh, that's change. Where do they tell us what we should depreciate it over? Somewhere they tell me the period. I know it's in here somewhere. Anybody see it? Oh, here it is. Hello. Oh, well. Okay, any intangible. I mean, I don't know why they're limiting that to patents. It's amortized over the shorter of the estimated life or remaining legal life, whichever is shorter. In other words, if I have the patent to develop a flip phone and they gave me that patent for 20 years, well, by now, who cares if I have the patent for a flip phone because everyone uses a smartphone. So I would go ahead and amortize that over the shorter of the remaining uh, legal life or estimated uh, useful life, economic life. Okay, okay, good. Now, franchise, okay? And when we look at franchises, there are a couple of different fees you pay. One is an initial franchise fee, and that will be recorded at the present value of whatever it is that you're paying for that franchise. That will be capitalized, okay? And that will be amortized, just like any intangible. And then, um, we may see continuing franchise fees. And typically, those continuing franchise fees are something that are based on something like a percentage of revenue or something, okay? And it might include things like management training, et cetera. And those should be reported as an expense. So flashcard that. Okay, for example, let's say I buy uh, Auntie Anne's uh, pretzel place and she charges me 50000 just for the right to hang the sign out. Well, that's an initial franchise fee that has future economic benefit. I'm going to capitalize that as an intangible asset. I'm going to depreciate it. But let's say she has to come in and train me how to flip pieces of dough into, into a pretzel. I don't know if you ever watched them do this. It's amazing. They just go, whoa and somehow they turn it into a pretzel. She got to train me how to do that, and she charges me a percentage of revenue. Well, to properly match that against the revenue, I would expense the continuing franchise fee. Okay, let's just look at this one because I think it's kind of helpful. Okay, uh, Peter signed an agreement on July 1st to operate a franchise. The initial franchise fee was $75,000 with a $25,000 down payment. And then they took um, 10,000, uh, five equal annual payments of 10,000 beginning July 1st, year two. Uh, the expected life of the asset is 10 years. Present value of the 10,000 is 37,908. And you may recognize that number, guys. We take the 10,000 and at 10% for five years, remember I told you last time the factor was 3.7908 when I gave you an example. Of how to deal with a note. Okay. So that's where they get that 37,908 present value of 25,000 is 25,000. Bottom line is what? The down payment is 25,000. You don't have to discount that. So, bottom line, the franchise has a present value of 62,908. I report the note payable of 50. Remember on my balance sheet, the note payable would show up, and I think I showed it to you in the context of receivable before, but the no payable would be displayed, then what? Discount 12,092. And remember, I told you the discount is the difference between what? The net present value of the no, which we just calculated at 62,908 using that present value of the annuity factor. And that was 10%, even though the problem didn't tell me it was 10%. That's what it was. Okay, that's where that factor would have come from to turn that into the present value of 37,908. Okay, now we would calculate interest expense 
on this. Okay, so for that first year, we would take the 62,000, um, the, um, in this case, the, the discount would be, um, uh, what am I doing? The discount on the note payable is 12,000. So the net present value isn't, what am I doing? Is actually 37,908. is a net present value. And I would take that times the 10%. And since this transaction happened at the uh, beginning of the year, my interest expense, I'm calculating the interest expense now. The interest expense is going to be this 37,908. times the 10% divided by two. My interest for that first year would be 1,089,540, right? Because that was the net present value of what I borrowed on that note, okay? And then I would continue on like that, figuring out the interest expenses. I make the $10,000 payment on the note, the note amount would come down, the carrying the discount would do what the discount would come down and the carrying value of the note would come down and multiply that times 10 percent then the further years would be the full year's interest and then i also have to recognize the amortization expense on this so not only would there be the interest expense there would also be the amortization of the franchise that i had um, capitalized at present value okay Okay, good. So flashcard, you capitalize at present value, what you're paying for that franchise, you expense any continuing franchise fees, which um, I don't think this problem mentioned continuing franchise fees, did it? No, but if it did, that would not be part of that calculation. Those would be expensed, right? That would not be part of what you capitalize for that asset. They didn't mention continuing franchise fee, but if they did, you would not include that in that calculation. Okay. All right. Startup costs, very easy. Startup costs, guys, are expensed. Rule of conservatism, most businesses go what? Go belly up after, you know, a little while. And so FASB says, hey, we're not going to have you capitalizing a bunch of startup costs, like, you know, um, legal fees, that sort of thing. Um, you know, we're going to have you expense those. That's the rule. Okay, now let's go ahead and look at research and development. And I've sort of already mentioned this. Research and development, they are expensed. That's the general rule. So you can put on the blank side of the flashcard, general rule, research and development are expensed unless you have one of the two exceptions. One exception is if we are going to continue to use something that we spent on an asset for our research and development or another alternative purpose beyond the life of the current period. So if we're gonna to continue to use that beyond the current period, then we capitalize. And if we're gonna to continue to use it for research and development in the future, then the depreciation on that would be part of my research and development expense, but you don't expense the entire amount. Now, if you're buying some facility and you're gonna use it up during the current year, then of course you would expense that entire amount, okay? The other situation is if you're conducting research and development on behalf of another, okay? So now what happens? I'm a university and you're paying me to do the research and development for some pill that's gonna cure some disease or something. Well, what happens? I would capitalize that, I'm the university in this case, I would capitalize that because I'm creating an inventory asset that I'm gonna later on and sell to you. Now, what happens? When you purchase that research and development from me, you expense it. So ultimately it hits what? It hits the expense, not of 
the university is they're developing that item, which is essentially inventory that they're going to sell to somebody else under a contract. It's got to be under a contract. I can't just be doing research and development and hoping I can sell it to somebody someday. There has to be a contract in which I've ag you've agreed that no matter what, you'll purchase the results of that research from me. As I'm doing spending money on that research, I will capitalize that. When I sell it to you, you expense it. And then I would treat it as what? As essentially a cost of goods sold um, as I um, sell that item. So I'd have the credit to sales for whatever I sold it to you for. And I'd have to debit the cost of goods sold for any cost that I had um, accumulated uh, while I was uh, performing that R&D. Okay. Okay, good. So flashcard those exceptions. Flashcard, include on your flashcard what the purchaser does, purchaser expenses, and the you know entity conducting the R&D, they'll capitalize it because that was the exception. But ultimately, when they sell it, they'll treat it as what? As a cost of goods sold. Okay. Now, items not considered research and development. And what gets a little confusing here sometimes is these are good expense items. They should be expense, but they are not research and development. So what these questions are asking you is what should be included on the research and development line item on the financial statements? And that's a big deal here in you know, Northern California where most of the venture capital is, continues to be raised. I always hear people say, oh no, now Texas is where all the venture capital is. Everywhere is a pipsqueak compared to um, Sand Hill Road in Palo Alto. Okay. Everything else is a joke in comparison to the research and development that's done right here in our neck of the woods. Okay, So these other states that try to claim, well, no, we're growing. They're a pipsqueak compared to Silicon Valley. Okay, And really, uh, Sand Hill Road, Palo Alto, Stanford. Okay, so what happens? Um, what we're trying to figure out is what should be gathered and reported as an expense on the income statement in that research and development line item. Some expenses that we incur that would still be reported on the income statement would probably be more of an administrative selling cost. For example, marketing research, quality control testing. I don't know what reformulation of a chemical compound is, but it certainly doesn't sound like research because it's reformulation of something. So flashcard those. Those are expenses. The question you ask you, what are the expenses? You include those, but they are not part of the research and development line item on the financial statements. Okay. Okay, good. Now let's look at this example. Okay. And notice materials used in research and development. Yep, part of the research and development line item. Um, equipment that has alternative uses in the future. Um, and so the key word here is what? Future. If they're going to continue to use it past the current period, you don't take the whole amount, but you do take what? The depreciation. Personnel cost. Yep. Got to take that. If you're spending personnel costs as an expense, if it's on research and development, yeah. Consulting fees, yeah. If you're using it for the research and development, it's part of the line item. Consulting fees for the research and development, yep. Yeah. So the key takeaway, you kind of went a long way to get there, is how to deal with that equipment that had the alternative life. You just take the depreciation on that. If they said that you're not going to use this anymore past the current period, then expense the whole amount. Okay, it's basically a matching question more than anything. Okay, good. Computer software development costs. What happens? And this is where US GAAP gets a little annoying because they're telling you what? Uh, they say, okay, research and development, you have to expense it. Unless we're talking about software development. If we're talking about software development, okay, then you'll follow the general rule of research and development. You'll expense any cost for planning, design, coding until you have achieved, guys, and the key word to include on your flashcard is technological feasibility, okay? So up until technological feasibility expense, once you have reached technological feasibility, and they give us examples of what those are, I don't 
care about that because the key phrase you have to know is what? Technological feasibility. Once you have achieved technological feasibility, now you can capitalize cost after technological feasibility. So before expense, after capitalize. Now, what should you do with the amount that you capitalize? And you will amortize that over the greater, and it's whichever gives you the greater in any given year, uh, gives you the greater amount of amortization using one of these two methods, percentage of revenue or straight line. Okay, now let's say that after technological feasibility, I had capitalized $100,000 of software development costs. Let me just put some numbers on this. Okay, and let's say that in year one, okay, uh, the software has a 10 year economic life. Guys, I know software doesn't have a 10 year economic life, but just humor me here. Okay, has a 10 year economic life. Say that the total projected profit on this project is, um, I gotta find this. Sorry, numbers. Okay, say the total is four million dollars total revenue. And the first year I got a million dollars of that of revenue. That comes out to 25%. What is greater, the straight line or the percent of revenue? Percent of revenue is greater. Percent of revenue is greater. So in that year, I'll use percent of revenue. Good. Let's say in year two now, year two, and let's say in year two now, my um, revenue on this is 200000 And let's say my estimate of the total hasn't changed. It's four million. That gives me what? Five percent, which is greater in your two, the straight line or the percent of revenue? Straight line. Straight line. So I would switch to straight line. So you toggle back and forth as you're amortizing that uh, cost that you capitalize between straight line and um, percentage of revenue, whichever is greater, okay? Like all inventory items that we talked about last time, you will carry that at the lower of cost or uh, market, okay? And their market would be equal to our net realizable value. We talked about that last time. So software costs that you are capitalizing and you're gonna sell that is gonna be added to your inventory as you capitalize the amounts that you spend after technological feasibility you amortize that but then you'd have to look at the amortized cost versus its net realizable value and if the net realizable value has fallen below that amortized cost you write it down to that lower uh, net realizable value okay okay good now if you are developing software for internal use only, okay? You will expense cost through the preliminary project state, okay? So flashcard that, and then capitalize any cost after the preliminary project state. So in effect, we've done what? We have substituted the word technological feasibility for uh, preliminary project state, okay? Now, we shall amortize any cost that we capitalize after the preliminary project state, and we will amortize that on a straight line basis. If we later turn around and sell that, and guys, they get a little wordy here. They say any amount we receive should first be applied to the unamortized carrying value of any amounts that were capitalized. Any difference would be recognized as a gain or loss or they say here would be recognized as revenue, but they probably should have said as a gain or loss, okay? Um, well, that's the case of any asset. 
I mean, any asset, if we sell it for less than its carrying value, that's a loss. If we sell it for more than its carrying value, that's a gain. Okay. Okay, good. Let's go ahead and let's take a look at a couple questions. Hey guys, we're at about two minutes. I'll give you, um, I'll give you the thirty seconds on this one. Okay, guys, uh, I'm going to go ahead and um, end the poll on this and um, share the results. And uh, most of us got this right. This question has a couple of different layers to it, though. It's a good question because it really kind of tests all the rules that we talked about dealing with an intangible. Okay, so let's just look at this together, though. Um, they tell us that they were granted a patent and they properly capitalized 45,000 of related costs. Okay, you don't question the question. You say, hey, says that capitalized it. Okay, and it was appropriate. So I'm going to capitalize that 45,000. They amortized the patent over its estimated useful life of 15 years. So if I'm taking that 45,000, and I'm dividing it by 15 years, that means I'm going to amortize, what, 3,000 a year if I'm doing my math right? Okay. Now, um, during year four, we paid 15,000 in legal costs. Now, that means that I must have amortized this, what, all of your one, all of your two, all of your three, you can count on your fingers for questions like this, that's three fingers. Okay. And, um, so we take those three years times the 3,000 per year. That means that they would have up to year four amortized 9,000 off of that, right? So beginning in year four, we had 36,000 left. And then somebody came and challenged us and we were successfully defended the infringement lawsuit should we capitalize that was that one of the exceptions
Do you want to capitalize that? Yes. Okay, legal defense, we capitalize that. Thank you, that was one of the exceptions. So now we've got 15,000 that we capitalized. So year four, the thing had gone up to 51,000. And then after the legal action was completed, Gary sold the patent to the plaintiff for 75. And there was no amortization in the year of disposal. So in year four, which is what they're asking me for, I sold the thing for 75,000. That's where they came up with what the gain of 24,000 because I sold an asset. And that's the case of any asset. I sold it for more than its carrying value. Okay, with a little bit of time we have left, let's do this. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Um, what do we got? Two questions left here. Let's just go ahead and do question two. I'll let you do that, and then we'll do yeah, and we'll do question three together. So I'll let you do question two on your own. Then we'll do three together. Okay, guys, for the sake of time, I'm going to cut you off in a minute and a half. Um, so um, I'm going to go ahead and end the poll and um, share the results with you. And it looks like most of us got this right. The answer is C. And the trick here was really um, to know not to uh, include the... Um, ongoing franchise fee as part of the cost of the franchise. So they capitalized this 50,000. Okay. And then they tell us an additional franchise fee of 3% and they give us the revenue and whatnot. Well, that's all distractor. I'm underlying it. I should probably be just striking it out. That has nothing to do. That's all expensed. The what the asset, the franchise, we would what amortize over the 10 years. So that would be what 5,000 per year. And since they're asking us at the end of that first year, we would have amortized 5,000. So we would be showing what the 45,000. Those other choices, I assume, must have had you doing something with that. No. We don't do anything with that. That's all, that has nothing to do with the carrying value of the asset. That is all expensed. Okay, good. As I said, we'll do this one together. And um, we take a look and they say that they want to know what should be included as research and development expense. Okay. Now, when you look at this equipment purchase for current and future years, I'm not going to take all of that because the word future is there. They tell me it has a five-year life though. So 100,000 divided by what? The five years means that I'll take, um, what does that come out to? 20,000 for that? 
Okay, so I dealt with that one because it's being used for current and future projects. So I don't want to take all of it. Equipment to purchase for the current year only. Yeah, I know I got to get that. That's 200,000. How about salaries? Yeah, salaries are expense. And since they're for research and development, that would work. Legal fees to obtain a patent. Is that research and development? No, that could be part of the amount that I'm out to capitalize for the patent, but it's not an expense of research and development. So then materials and labor for prototype products. Now, little test taking technique. Let's say I don't know what to do with that one. If I add the ones that I'm comfortable with here, I get a total of what, 620? Is 620 an answer? No. So the question kind of was expecting that I might not quite know what to do with prototype things. And, but when I look at the choices, I'm like, well, hell, the only way I can get to any of the choices would be to include them. So even though they got a little wonky here on this prototype crap, like who knows, man, I'm not a research and development accountant, you know, they should really be testing industry specific stuff that can closely, but then I can't, they, they, they move into, well, they're going to test your intelligence by what making you sit there and say, well, the only way for things that I should know from my study of my flashcards is those things. And this other thing wasn't on my flashcard, but I can't include it. I can't get the answer unless I include it. And now that should be part of your flashcards as to something that's research and development, because now you've had a question that you saw that that was the case. So you could add that to your flashcard as an example of something that's a research and development. And there may be other questions in your homework that you'll see that have that same kind of thing where you can add from understanding of the question of these more wonky things. Question. Okay, guys, we are already over the bonus time. So I am going to leave module eight for next time. We will get into chapter four, obviously, uh, next time. I know we're running behind. Uh, I'm just going to keep chasing that until we get to where we need to uh, make some alternative plans as to how we're going to get through the material. But right now, I just want to forge forward with uh, the way things are laid out for us. Okay, question. All right, guys, I will see you on next week. Have a good rest of the week. Make sure you're keeping up with these seven modules in chapter three. Thank you. Have a good Thank night. You. Bye. Thank All you. Right. Bye.